Welcome to Space is Lonely, a video channel where I play table games usually by myself, hence the title. Uh, this is an experiment that I conducted yesterday where I've been trying to figure a way to play Battlestar Galactica Starship Battles solo. I found that on several threads and forums for Wings of War and related games, there have been several attempts to replicate um, combat, uh, competitive play solo. But it's very hard when the AI sometimes doesn't act appropriately. So I've been playing with this uh, experimental system where I use dice mostly to determine what the AI will do. Now you can see in the setup that there are two Mark II Vipers. Those come in the base set, as well as on the right side, the SCAR model. It may seem like an unfair fight to have two against one, but I found that the Cylons have a big advantage in using their FTL drives, and I am allowing for FTL uh, faster than light jumps in this simulation. Now here I am using a set of Gaslands dice, actually just one die, to determine what the AI will do. Now on the dice used for Gaslands, most of the sides, three of the six sides, have what's called a shift, and this is a uh, death race simulation game in which you could gear up and gear down based on what you roll. And for the purposes of the Battlestar game, we're using the shift as a possible speed up or a speed down. And I combine this die with a fate die, the dice used for the role playing game Fate or Fudge. And there are two negative sides, two positive sides, and two blank sides. So if that were to be rolled, we could determine if they're going to speed up or down. The slide is one of the six sides. If that's the case, then it just follows its natural kinetic energy doing a straight maneuver. If you roll a spin on the die, then that means that the ship will rotate if an enemy ship is in arc. And if you roll the exclamation point, that will be FTL or faster than light speed. And that's a jump that could only occur twice per ship in a, a game if you're using the FTL option. However, because we're using AI, there's an unlimited amount of times so that the ship may jump. And I will demonstrate how that works uh, if and when that happens in this solo match. So here I am rolling for the Cylon, and I roll a slide. So that means, as I said before, that we're just going to follow the kinetic energy that it currently has. And I start all the ships at three kinetic energy. So it's going to move a straight three. Okay, so that concludes turn one. No ships are within range for combat, so we're just going to move right to turn number two. And here I'm electing to just do the same or similar maneuver, uh, go as three straight, not changing the kinetic energy at all, seeing what the Cylon will do before I make any sort of fancy maneuvers, if any. Okay, rolling for the Cylon. Here we have a shift, and now we're going to grab the Fate die, and that's going to be speeding down. And now I'm going to grab the four-sided die, and we see that it's going to go down three. So that means it's going to remain stationary and do a zero maneuver. And if you ever watch the show Battle of Star Galactica, Scar is a enemy ship who has uh, survived many battles and therefore his artificial intelligence tends to be deeper than most of the other Cylon ships. So if you want to interject some cinematic uh, moments into the scene, you can imagine Scar just hanging back, scanning with his moving red eye, seeing what the humans will do. Still not in range, so we're moving right into turn number three. And now the humans are being more, more cautious. They're moving only at a one speed, so that's going to change their kinetic energies down to one, and we'll see what SCAR will do. Now because uh, the way I, I rule this is that if SCAR or the enemy ship or the AI in general is at a zero or negative one, they're automatically going to shift up. So I roll the four-sided die here, and they're going to go back to three. 
And now that they're moving at three, this is the first time in the solo match that I'm going to use a maneuver for SCAR that's determined randomly with a die roll. And I worked out this system where I lay out the most likely maneuvers and I assign them to certain die rolls. So here we could see the allocation of what will happen. At the top are the regular maneuvers and at the bottom are overboost maneuvers if the AI is going beyond the kinetic energy of three. And the maneuvers are kind of self-explanatory. I stack the similar stuff on top of itself so it saves room on the table. And if it were to roll something that was perhaps a turn or a bank or something of that sort, I would choose whichever one was more advantageous for the AI. You could see that the two tight turn maneuvers at the bottom are not associated with any die, and that's because if there's no ship within the arc, range doesn't matter actually, just the arc matters, then one of those would be chosen depending on which one will get them back into the fight. And similarly, if there's no enemy in the arc, then they would not do the top uh, two rows of maneuvers, but they would choose the third row and let that die roll determine which tight turn they're going to make. So keeping that system in mind, I'm going to roll for the Cylon. It rolls a one. A one or a two is just a simple straight maneuver. So far, not too exciting from the Cylon end of things. Okay, so now that multiple ships are now in range, we'll finally enter a combat phase. And the Cylon will always shoot first. It will have quick shot, and that's to give it a slight advantage because it's outnumbered. And also it's scar, so it should have an advantage over some average pilots. And both of these pilots are average. They have no modifiers. SCAR has a plus three modifier, so pretty much anything uh, other than a one or a two is probably going to hit. Okay, in this case, it hits the yellow or the B pilot, and it gives it a critical four, which will damage its wings. And that will mean that now that ship can no longer perform overboosts. Okay, so one of the Vipers missed, and I'm just making sure that the other roll was legitimate and it is indeed in range um, or in arc. And there, the Cylon suffering a three critical and then picking up another uh, chit, which is a two, so adding up to five damage. So a pretty good turn. And now uh, we keep in mind that the Cylon is equipped with Nimble Pilot and Daredevil, and this is because there will be times where the rolls will actually exceed the 4G limit, so therefore he should not be bound by a 4G limit, and he can perform um, difficult maneuvers after a previous difficult maneuver. And I point this out now because you'll see that he suffered a systems failure, and even though I note it on the HUD, it's not going to affect his maneuvering. Okay, so a slight turn from the B pilot, and the A pilot is going to stand still, anticipating that Scar may pass by his windshield, which he will not because he's rolling an FTL. So here is how FTL works. We're going to pick up the FTL marker, and we're going to place it 15 centimeters, which is uh, easily marked on the range ruler. You should place the 678 portion of the random generator uh, straight on the range ruler because those are the most likely die rolls to happen. And I do indeed roll a 7. And we're going to put it 5 centimeters uh, from the point that it originates. Now, for some reason here, I mess up. I don't put it in the right space, but I think that'll be corrected in no time because he is going to make a turn towards the Viper pilot. So it's a mistake, but it's really not much skin off Scar's nose because he will be in range after this roll. So he rolls a six. And since nothing is an arc, he's going to choose one of those tight turns, whatever tight turn will bring him into firing arc. Okay, so no modifier needed. He rolls a 7. 
he hits the B pilot, and the B pilot is suffering, I believe, just one there. So you could see why this two against one matchup might work. Uh, the FTL is a devastatingly advantageous thing to have. Uh, right now, those Viper pilots have got to probably make some turns, and I believe the yellow one, yep, is going to choose to turn 180. Of course, he has to choose a straight maneuver to do so. And for some reason, the A pilot is going to remain stationary yet again. I should mention that I think this fisheye effect that's on the camera, it's sort of deceptive. It seems like the A pilot will have no chance of catching Scar in arc, but if Scar were to do a three or maybe overboost straight, there might be a chance. So it's not quite what I had seen looking at it from my angle um, in, in real time. So we're going to shift again, perhaps. Uh, no, we're not. We're going to stay at three kinetic energy, rolling for the maneuver. And one and two is a straight. So again, unimaginative uh, maneuvering by SCAR. But that should be enough to get the B pilot in range. Now, it's important to note that Scar will shoot first always. That's rather important. Uh, there's no sense of initiative in uh, Battlestar Starship battles. So if you could take that as an advantage as a talent, that could be huge because you're taking a potential return fire off the board. So both are trading five damage this turn, getting each up to 10. And the Raiders, have one more hull point than the Vipers. So it's 15 to kill the Raider and 14 to kill the Viper. Okay, now that the B pilot is properly turned, he's not going to change anything about his orientation. He's just going to take a free kinetic ride backwards. So that should be a zero maneuver, but with kinetic three, he goes backwards and he's now hidden behind a HUD and he's still as the marker to show that he will be drifting again in the next turn. Okay, so shifting down um, to negative oops, to negative four, so that's going to go all the way back down, actually even further than zero to negative one. So he's going to do a backwards maneuver, a tentative backwards maneuver. And with the backwards maneuvers, I work it a little differently. There are, I believe, only four backwards maneuvers. So I just label them one, two, three, four, and if I roll above that, then just disregard and roll, roll again. So that's choice one. That is not choice two, I'm just holding it the wrong way. So choice one will perhaps have me in arc of the red, but choice two will take me out of arc. So I'm going to go with the first backward maneuver. And that A pilot keeps uh, staying stationary in the hopes that something will fly past it, but that strategy has not worked out at all. Okay, so that's going to be at normal range. And as usual, it's a hit. But a zero. So Scar is firing rubber bullets at pilot A. All right, now um, that does not make the cut because it's normal range and there's uh, no modifiers to that. Okay, moving into the next movement phase. As we said before, if you're at zero or negative one, you're going to automatically shift up for the next turn. Now, unlike a regular game of Battlestar um, Starship Battles, you're going to not have to hide any of the maneuvering. Um, so it's okay to maneuver with uh, you know, real-time decisions, not putting the cards face down, and that sort of keeps things um, 
you know, cl clear in your head. Is that a slight advantage for the human player? Maybe. But once I pick up a card, you have to commit to it. So uh, taking it off the table is a full commitment. I believe that Pilot B will try to get back into the action, not drift too far away. So I'm taking the Drift Ruler here. And since I'm at Kinetic Energy 3, I'm only going back a little bit before I commit to a forward maneuver. Now I return the Drift Ruler to the base just to mark where the ship is as I reorient it to the zero so that I'm moving in the direction I'm facing. From here I commit to, I believe it's a slight right, or we should use the uh, nautical terms, a starboard maneuver. Keep it legit. Okay, and we're hoping that Scar will wind up between the wickets of these two ships, um, yet the A pilot has not yet committed. Um, standing still has not worked out for him at all. So I think he's going to try to turn here. He's going to do a speed one turn. If anyone spots any mistakes, please let me know. Um, I've played this several times, solo mostly, only a handful of times with actual live human beings. Um, most of the people around here are invested in other miniatures games, um, some of them more costly than others, if you know what I'm talking about. But I've really enjoyed this game primarily because of the size of the, the game so far. It really can't expand terribly far unless you go really deep into sort of off canon material. But I found that other miniatures games were a bit of a headache to keep up with financially and, you know, in terms of overpowering and things of that nature. So here we have some attacks. We have an exchange of fire. All the damage has been noted on the HUDs. And in this case, we're going to... Oh, this is devastating. All right, so Scar has picked up very high numbers uh, this match. I've played this a few times where actually Scar has um, usually taken out one ship by this point in the game but that's just the luck of the draw. So as I was saying before, Scar's Untimely Demise, I've really enjoyed this game, uh, not just because of the cost benefits, but it also tries to simulate space combat in a more thoughtful way. I like the kinetic energy a great deal. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed watching it as much as I've enjoyed demoing it, and uh, I hope to see you back here with some new content perhaps soon.